Welcome to Terry Lawson Photography Conversations. It's January 15th, 2018, and it's a beautiful, cold Alberta winter's day on the prairies. Today we are going to be talking with Jeff Wallace, a full-time photographer from St. Albert, Alberta. Jeff was born in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. When he was growing up, his family moved to Virginia in the United States and he also spent some time in Texas where he received some of his education. He eventually made his way back to Toronto where he worked for RBC in wealth management. It was when he was transferred to the Channel Island of Jersey, which is south of England and west of Normandy, France, that his love of photography began. So sit back and relax and enjoy my conversation with Jeff. Welcome to Conversations. <laughs> great, great to be here. <laughs> so you've been a busy boy uh, the last few days. Uh, you've been yeah. up to up to the mountains to yeah, help yeah. in a workshop. Yeah. Uh, you were out this morning taking the sunrise in cold. the freezing cold. That was, it was cold. <laughs> and now you're uh, you're thrust into having to talk to me. <laughs> Very so, yeah. so tell me about tell me about the the workshop. How was that? Well, the workshop was really good. It was over uh, two nights, uh, helping Paul Zitzka. Yeah, um, he started this this new sort of workshop series on on uh, astrophotography. Oh wow! But it has his sort of touch to it, where he'll also arrange models to be out on the ice, and so it's a blend of both astrophotography under the night sky with Rundle. As well as, you know, we even got lucky with some northern lights mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the two nights ago. Got some of those. But having people on the ice, like, for example, like a fat biker with a, you know, with, with a light. And, I mean, for him, this is his style of trying to create the, the foreground. Because um, a lot of times you just have a frozen lake and you're like, well, that's kind of That's dull. a frozen lake, yeah. <laughs> but if you have a skier out there... You know, with a headlamp, and then with the the night mm -hmm. sky and Rundle, it's it just makes the photographs more interesting. So it's a combination of both the night sky, the astrophotography. How do you do that? And you know, how do you work your camera in the dark with gloves on? And you it tends to focus people on other aspects of their camera that they're not familiar with, like focusing manually with live view at minus ten. Right? There's really. You know, it, it's just it's just interesting. So it was it was really successful, and uh, I was I was assisting with with two other photographers, Trent and Collie. Yeah, it was really good, and I love being in the mountains. I mean, who doesn't, right? No, I know who doesn't. <laughs> when I drove down, I drove down through Nordegg. Yeah, and I saw and the, took the, the long pictures way. you took at Abraham Lake. Yeah. yeah, I mean it's a bit of a mess right now, uh, in Preacher's Point. Yeah, it's a bit. You know, as as it is, uh, but I did see a lot of people out on the mm -hmm. out on the ice just south of Windy Point. Mm -hmm. So the the lake, the further north you get, the more snow covered it is. Yes. Then you get in the half and half around Windy Point, yeah. and then further south there was a lot more clear ice, and I yeah. can see more people. Yeah. I mean, I was doing a drive by and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. But it reminded me of something that I. You know how you're driving along and you just you see a scene and you pull over, you stop, you take a you know, a snap, and then you move on. But as I was looking into the pictures last night, I thought about creating a new sort of series of, well, where am I, or where is this? And I'll, I'll start with a narrow perspective. Oh, okay, gotcha. And then if people yeah. get it, you know, kudos to them. But then maybe go a little wider, mm -hmm. kind of like hint number two, mm -hmm. and then hint number three. And it just, it just dawned on me because I think people would not recognize the first shot, right? Oh, this is a bit of a different take. But if you expand a bit more, oh, I recognize that feature. I know he's at Abraham Lake. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and no, I, I, exactly. I thought, and that, I and that's, that's interesting. Kind of... I mean, we were talking, I was talking about cooking late before we, yeah. we started this, and uh, uh, Peter Carroll and I were taking photographs of uh, grasses that right. were covered in frost. Mm-hmm. And that's another example where you could take that as your first photograph, right? In that series, yeah. And eventually, yeah. you open up to oh, oh, that's oh, I know cooking that. late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> that's yeah. a great idea. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, I thought that was kind of uh, kind of 
kind of neat. So obviously you have this uh, this wonderful passion for t photography. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, uh, where did it all start? Where did you where did you get this this uh, this love for what you're doing right now? Yeah, yeah. I, I it started when we lived overseas. Uh, we lived on the the bailiwick of Jersey, which is in the Channel Islands, which is off the coast of France. So it's about 100 miles south of England and like 15 miles off the coast of, mm -hmm. of France. And the first camera we got was because my daughter Brenna was born. So I got to take snaps of her and all that <laughs> kind of stuff. Yeah. And then uh, and then three years later, Kira was born. By then, I'd been taking photographs. And Dana had been taking pictures. And, mm -hmm. And then I kind of use that as a bit of a rationale for, I think I need a, another camera, like a new one. Mm -hmm. So we started with a simple Lumix. Then we went to a slightly better Lumix. You know, where at the time I only knew that optical zoom was good as opposed to you know, <laughs> digital. And, you know, you have the dial, which is like you press it for W or back for T and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But then started to look around and how beautiful the island is. You know, with its castles, with its fortresses, with its beaches, cliffs. I mean, just just everything. So I would say the seed was planted on, on, on Jersey. And uh, just sort of documenting the island or the experiences, um, like spring tides. So whenever you have a storm with a spring tide, you get a lot of surf. Mm -hmm. And the island is, is, there's a lot of defenses on the island, both... Um, like 17th, 18th century boundaries. But when the Germans occupied Jersey, they also built anti-tank walls. These huge concrete, you know, 15 feet, yeah. 6 foot uh, deep concrete walls. And so the surf would come in and it would just crash against that and it would just mm. be flung up in the air. Mm -hmm. So you'd, you'd say, oh, I want to go experience that. <laughs> <laughs> but then seawater kind of affects your camera it's not good. Got, no, no it's, it's not this good. thing stop working so, you know. so yeah it started on on, uh, on on Jersey and almost like a, a precursor I remember the time that I, I took my first night photograph you know where you put the camera on the seawall mm -hmm. and you press the button and it's you know it's automatic everything so it goes well I'm going to go to 30 seconds and then you look at the finished picture and, and you're just blown away by it actually picked up some stars and you can see the distant lights in Normandy. Mm -hmm. And then I took another picture, and it was sort of like a half moonlit night, you know, half moon with clouds. And then took another picture, and and the open sky was blue. Mm -hmm. And I just, what the, <laughs> what the <laughs> heck is this kind of <laughs> sorcery going on? And, and so you, there's these little moments when you're just, you know... Um, fascinated by the landscape around you, the pictures that you can take, um, and just that sort of discovery and, and, and wonder. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, it was on, yeah. I would say it was on Jersey. Then we moved to Alberta, and then that's when it really started to take off. Yeah. You know, we, we lived on a small island because it's only nine miles, nine miles long by, you know, five miles tall. And uh, we were never really... Island was it island fever? Like we mm -hmm. just we we loved the place, but then we moved to Alberta, and you're you're so close to the mountains, and it's big. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's big. Just, it's big. It's different. And then when you hit the mountains, you're just holy what the smoke. heck is this? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. And then yeah, the the rest is history. I suppose. Yeah, of course. But there was the uh, you know I shoot night sky a lot and chase the northern lights and things like that so I remember there's a friend of mine that brought me over here um, as part of work and he told this story once where he was at a dinner party I guess and and he came outside I think this was one of the selling points to come here but, um, <laughs> I guess it was a thin overcast night and he looked up and the, and the, the clouds had a bit of a green like green obviously that's the northern lights right and uh I remember the first time then actually sort of shooting and chasing the Northern Lights and, and you know, like we're talking like 20, 30 second exposure I and mean, everything's <laughs> just kind of, you know, washed out. But yeah. holy smokes, you actually caught something. Yeah. And so I've been chasing that for, 
you know, five, six, maybe seven years. Yeah. As the solar vax was getting stronger and stronger. Yeah. yeah. So it was kind of like the 2000 stock rally. Yeah. You know, no matter what you did, it just kept getting better <laughs> and better. Yeah. But no, it was good. I mean, you know, you, you, it was really quite fortunate where we could see decent northern lights almost every every two to three weeks. Yeah. Provided cloud cover didn't right. interfere with the mm-hmm. the view. Yeah. So as you as you got into your photography, uh, would you say that uh, you are a self-taught photographer, or did you actually take any courses or anything to trial and error? I guess. Yeah, uh, I would say I would say ninety percent of it is trial and error. Mm-hmm. I would examine other photographers' pictures. Yeah. And just well, how on earth did they do that? How did how do you do that? <laughs> and and you just through trial and error and and experimentation um figure out how they do it. Doesn't mean you're a master at it, but yeah. you're you're sort of learning the, the 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 technical pieces you need which eventually you assemble into stronger and stronger images. Yeah, and it, and isn't that uh, isn't that the fun of it, right? Is uh, is this whole learning aspect yeah, you're continually yeah. learning, and yeah. and every once in a while you find out how to do something, and you say, "Holy smokes!" Yeah, yeah, it's the pursuit. Yeah, not only yeah. is it the pursuit of what you're interested in, but it's also learning how to do it better and better, so that the images reflect really what you what you sense and what you perceive and what you see. Yeah, um, but also others can enjoy as well. Yeah, exactly. Here's an interesting question that I always think about, and, and that is, uh, what gives you your joy or fuels your passion for your photography? Hmm. Um, it's, it's often the, the, the joy. Joy comes from, well, would you look at that? Isn't that extraordinary? Isn't that crazy? Like... Um, I tell this story often is a lot of people go to the Michener viewpoint in in uh, Abraham Lake and they're looking at Mount Michener and I think it's Mount Kidd over that way or yeah, or, yeah. or whatever and That's I'm right. like no <laughs> <laughs> turn around and look at the rock cut where the rock is is doing it's these all crazy thing. folds and curves and and kind of go how the heck did that happen you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And so I've, I've tried to go there a few times and actually try to shoot. It's hard. It is. It's, it's a, hard, a difficult shot. It's a hard target. Because it's either washed out in, in, in bright sunshine or in shade and so it's flat. Yeah. One time I got lucky and I caught it just as the sun was starting to pass by it. And the side light... Oh, gotcha. Just creates enough mm-hmm. relief mm-hmm. that it reveals you know, all the shadows and yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's just I just love that spot, and there's other places like that. Yeah. And then it makes you wonder, well, why is that? So then you get Ben Gad's book, <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, how nerdy can you be? You know? <laughs> Road tours of the Rocky Mountains, and he's got all these cool places. Yeah. But it tells the story of our Rockies, very different than the American Rockies. Yes, of course. Right? Yeah. But it helps explain what on earth you're looking at. Yeah. You know, it's not nowhere near the, the detail that I'll ever understand, but, you know, when it sort of explained that over millions of years, the rock is almost folded like plasticine, you go, oh, that's cool. Anyway, it's, 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 it's those things. So coming, circling back to the question of you know, what brings me joy is... Showing people what I'm interested in, in a good way, like beyond a, a snapshot. But then also for me, seeing things for the first time in, in a new manner as exactly. well. Exactly, right? exactly. Um, so that, that kind of drives me to scout a lot out in the country for old, let's say, old abandoned homesteads mm-hmm. as foreground for, let's say, the, you know, the, the Northern, Northern Lights. Lights or uh, the Milky Way. Or, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, and sometimes when you speak with you know local residents out there, that you you explain what you're doing, like I'm I just want to photograph the building or whatever, mm-hmm. and, and then uh, 
They'll often tell you the most interesting stories. Well, you'll start about talking the to them about <clears throat> yeah. the history of that old building. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. I love shooting solo trees. And so there's a solo tree up near Legal. And uh, uh, I mean, they are just rare as hen's teeth up here. Oh, they are, yeah. You know, because they just are. But this one was smack down near the middle of a field. And I'm like, well, it wasn't in the middle, it was like maybe 20 meters in, but photogenic. And uh, one time the landowner came by and, and uh, I asked him about the tree. I said, well, why is this tree here? Because normally, well, it's non-productive land. They have to cut it down and all that kind of stuff. So he explained, that, well, there used to be a shed there and the shed had a well. Oh, okay. Yeah. shed's gone now, but the tree serves as a marker for the well. And I'm like, everything has a purpose. <laughs> Another time I was, I was photographing a stand of trees. And the landowner came, uh, drove by and, and uh, was asking, like, what are you doing? And I said, well, tripod, I'm just shooting this stand, this, this wood in the middle of a, of a field that was farmed. And uh, they go, oh, okay, that's fine. And then I asked, I said, why, why, why do you have trees in the middle of a... So then she, she told the story of... Uh, it, it, it allowed her to recall memories when she was a girl when I think it was her father or her grandfather had the trees and he left them there and the kids used to go and play in the middle of the wood oh okay yeah so and then and then she had these memories that I think of like uh, like bonfires and storytelling and all this kind of stuff so he, he this this wood in the middle of this field was actually for the kids and I just thought Again, everything has a purpose, right? Yeah. But, but otherwise, everyone would drive by and go, well, Okay, well, whatever. <laughs> what the heck? But it was, really, it was really interesting, especially when you heard her you know, recall these, these, these memories. Mm -hmm. And I just thought, wow, that's pretty, that's pretty cool. Yeah. And they'd go out there and they'd sleep out there at night. Mm -hmm. You know, that's pretty cool. So I think uh, I talked to you about maybe going on a, a shoot somewhere. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, what do you say we pack up our gear and uh, we go do that? Let's pack it up, put on the heavy boots. <laughs> it's cold. <laughs> it's cold. We're just standing a lot. Just another Alberta day, blue sky, beautiful snow, and cold. Yeah. It's all good. Let's go make some. Okay. So, we're on our way to the photo shoot. Yep. All the gear's packed. Yep. Tripods, cameras, warm gear, floppy hats. Toop it's all with here. Pom -pom. Toop, toop with pom pom. There That's you right. Go. That's legit. <laughs> so where are we going, man? We're going to the McNally High School. Um, because of the clear blue sky and potential for color in the in the west, not a lot, but might get something. The idea is a really sort of nice, clean silhouette of the city um, through sunset and probably into the blue hour too we'll see how long we see how long we last <laughs> I want to get those those you know those crisp colors yeah you know, as the sky starts to dim and then the city kind of rises up and brightens to them to meet it we'll uh, we'll see how it goes one thing I've uh, always uh, enjoyed at sunset is of course there's uh, uh, you, there's the perspective of, of looking at the sky to the west, mm -hmm. but I always love to turn around. Yes, because the yes. colors behind you yes. are spectacular. Yes, they're that nice pastoral colors, you know. Yep, pastel yep. colors. Yep, yep. You get those. You get those. Um, you get the pinks. Yeah, you know, and. Uh, I think one person, I'm pretty sure, sometimes there's a brief moment when I think if the sky has enough in it and the sun sets and the color changes, but then you'll actually start to perceive the earth's shadow in the sky, like just a little bit, just so you have a bit of darkness along the horizon yes. and the darkness gets higher and higher and then there's this line and there's color above it. I believe that's actually the earth's shadow as you sort of perceive mm -hmm. it briefly 
But yeah, many times. Like the um, this morning sunrise wasn't taken looking to the east; it was taken looking south. Hmm. As you get the the sign light, right? You know, the color was far more advanced to the east, but sometimes side light is uh, it's very nice. As which looking behind you is the ultimate. <laughs> <laughs> So we live in a in an interesting time right now, where technology is advancing very very quickly, and what we have is we have millions and millions of photographers now mm -hmm. with their cell phones, uh, and everyone is out taking photographs. Yep. Or I. I I really prefer to call them snapshots yeah. of their day-to-day -day lives. And uh, uh, what do you, how do you, how do you look at that and, and compare to what you're doing as far as your photography is concerned? I mean, they go out, those people go out and take their picture Mm -hmm. And that's it. That's that's the photograph. Right. It's an instantaneous reaction to something that's going on. Right. But uh, here we are. We're going to go out and, and take a photograph. Deliberately. Deliberately. <laughs> exactly. My uh, choice. But but what what uh, what do you do uh, to to help you be in the right place at the right time? Right. To deliberately take that photograph. Um, well, it's it's the it's the planning, it's the it's the vision of what you hope to capture, um, and then the planning that that goes into it, um, like reading the sky, looking at the sky, seeing how you think it'll perform based upon the hundreds of times you've gone out before. Yeah. Um, so I'd say it's a combination of a vision. And then using technology, such as the forecasting that's now available. I mean, they had, they've had cloud models for years, right? But now um, companies are starting to use that cloud data to then forecast, oh, we think there's a 60% probability that you will get color off those clouds for your, for your shooting. So that, that helps take some of the guesswork out of it mm -hmm. when you're trying to pursue something it's 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 I mean a really crude example would be hey I want to go shoot the Milky Way and then you get out and you go oh it's a full moon what well, <laughs> it doesn't help <laughs> so you you want to you want to get your timings right and you want to use as much forecast data as you can to anticipate um, what may happen and then you then the other thing I do a lot is I also scout locations. Yeah, Spend hours and hours and hours um, scouting the countryside for, you know, abandoned homesteads or grain elevators or things of interest on the on, on the prairie that add to the story. It's um, there's a friend of mine who teaches like Paul and. He says, you know, the Rockies, they take care of themselves. It's all what you put in the foreground that that matters, that draws the eye, which is really just an understanding of how people read photographs. Right. Right? Yeah. So on the, on, the, um, on the prairie, I say, well, the northern lights, they take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. It's that the better, the stronger images of the northern lights are the ones where the folks have taken the time to try to find... An interesting foreground. Um, there's a friend of mine, uh, Mike Isaac. I think you. Yep. You know, actually, you did a conversation with Mr. Yeah, Isaac. Yeah. I mean, he's he's really good at putting the human element in the photograph, and, and some of the strongest ones he's made have people in the photograph reacting or responding to the auroras. I mean, it's it's more interesting um, when an individual or or a person is in the photograph. So it's, it's, it's those things. It's kind of like, 
ingredients in a recipe, and then we're just assembling the recipe, and, and, <laughs> and we hope it works. Because <laughs> sometimes you get out there, and it's like, whoa, well, that was a bit of a dud. Of, you know, this body of knowledge that you acquire over time, yep. you learn what works, and you learn what doesn't work, and you really learn from mistakes. Yeah. Right? So I find that the stronger images are the ones where you, you plan plan and then you take a chance and then the other thing as well is that once you get there you sometimes you then find yourself reacting or responding to the scene as it unfolds yeah and I think that that's where um, uh, experience and knowledge sort of take over too because if you know uh, uh, your craft right uh, and you as you say you get to that situation uh, you can react uh, yeah. quickly yeah. because of your knowledge and your experience. Nothing like a landscape runner. Sorry, nothing like a landscape photographer running. I always <laughs> laugh when, when I find myself running to just catch, you know, that that uh, that's and you find yourself doing it. Like even the grapes do it. You know, they just find themselves like, oh, <laughs> and, and you run to, to make, you know, to respond to, to get the to elements. The, to get to the better spot. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, whoops. You know, tripod, camera, bang, like all this junk and tow, which is kind of, uh, I guess, an oxymoron, right? Well, I remember when we were, when I was uh, taking photographs at Abraham Lake, and it was, it was a really interesting day that we were there because it was warm and uh, mm. um, the uh, we were um, west of, of, of uh, Preacher's Point at, at the corner. Okay. Yep. And uh, that whole area was just uh, uh, an inch of water. Oh, really? It was wow. absolutely incredible. Wow. As far as reflections. Yeah. And, and uh, no wind. And there was no wind. It oh, was just it was just absolutely awesome. beautiful. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there were uh, remnant snowdrifts over the lake mm. uh, that uh, sort of were uh, projecting above the water. Right. And so as you're moving around, you, you drop your camera bag uh, or, or whatever. And <laughs> after you've searched that shot right. and uh, walked many, many meters away, you look right. back and you say, oh, there's my camera bag back 200 meters from, oh, okay. from, where, from where I am on that little snow drift. Oh my god. <laughs> I was on Abraham a few years ago, and I wear, uh, I have like knee guards. Good idea. Just yeah. when I, because yeah, you're always kneeling on, on the ice, so I just put these knee guards on. And I, a gust of wind actually then picked me up in the sense of uh, knee guards, because they're plastic. And I actually got pushed across the ice for about 50 meters <laughs> until I bumped up against one of these these snow drifts. Snow drifts, yeah. yeah. I just went with it because I just thought, okay, this is hilarious. <laughs> as, you're just, <laughs> as you're being pushed across the ice. Yeah. Have you been on Abraham when the ice booms? Oh, yeah. Like it yeah, just, it's just the, the first time and you're all alone. What and the, the ice, heck is that? The ice is like 16, 18 inches thick and it booms. I mean, you're safe. But wow, is that ever unnerving, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Because yeah. it's that low, booming sound, and it kind of, kind of hits your boots, yeah. and then it kind of, wow. And those, uh, those are the things that uh, photography has brought into your life, right? You're you're in those places that not many people get to experience. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, yeah. You put yourself out there. You're in these, you're in these places, often getting up quite early. Yeah, the, yeah. It's the early or the late. Yeah. That uh, at sometimes it, it makes it difficult because you know I don't know if I. Uh, well, I guess I better. Yeah. No, it's. Yeah, a, we, my wife and I, we we camp in our t little oh, okay. two man tent and right. uh, to go out to these places and uh, I say to her, we're I'm going to be getting up at like two o'clock. Do you want to get up? In the morning, yeah, and uh, and she said, "Well, maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure, but 
every time that uh, she drags herself out of that tent and we were standing in this vista, wherever it might be, mm. it's always <coughs> like, this is incredible, absolutely incredible. And so uh, it's all worth it to, to make the effort. I'm thinking I might actually try something new today. If we get there in time and if I can get it set up, uh, I've got a solar filter. Yeah. And so what I've never done is I've never taken a shot of the sun against one of the towers oh. with a solar filter. Oh, that's interesting. I think that would be quite a neat bite, if you know what I mean. Yeah. I don't think that's been, uh, I haven't seen that yet. We can see what we get. Because I found the, found the solar filter in my bag and uh, I've got the lens and maybe have a, uh, have a go. That could be different. Mm -hmm. See what happens. You know, just as the sun is crossing a tower or something, yeah. you can still get the sunset. Let's just see what happens. So here we are. We've uh, got the cameras and tripods all set up. Sun has just gone down. We're above the Saskatchewan River over on the east side near Mc, uh, McNally High School, overlooking the downtown. It's a beautiful evening, nice clear sky, but beautiful clouds in the, in the west. So it's going to be interesting to see what we find. So, here we are, Jeff. We're now sort of looking through our cameras and trying to make some decisions about composition. And also, I'm, I'm curious about what you think about as far as lighting conditions and what settings you might use as, I guess, a starting point or your default to get things going. Yeah. Um, so for, for this, I would start at f11 to make sure that the depth of focus in yeah. the image is, is, is sharp. Yeah. Low ISO and uh, probably start about 1 20th of a second. I mean, we're all on tripods, so... Yeah. And then just make sure the histogram is is right. Yeah. I do tend to focus... Not focus, but expose for the highlights. Because yeah. I want to preserve all of that detail. We can always pull it out in post. It's interesting. One of the things I always... Well, I still kind of struggle with is... You know, at this time of day where the clouds... You see how they're almost that nuclear orange-yellow? Yeah. Our eye can perceive it. It's very hot. But I always find in the camera, how do you, how do you preserve the detail in the, in the cloud that we see and also preserve the hotness, the, the, the luminosity and, and, and the detail? And, and lately I've been, I've been trying to, to get better at that because, you know, if you pull down the highlights, right. it tends to get a bit yeah. flatter. Yeah. Well, you, okay, well, you haven't blown it out, but I don't know, it, it's, a, it's a good time of day to, to get the images to then, uh, to then work on that. Yeah. I did the same thing this morning. I had a 200 to 500, pointed it directly at where the sun would, would rise yeah. and took brackets. Gotcha. Just so yep. that I have the data. And, and my brackets, not, nothing crazy, just um, one under exposed and one over. Yeah. You know, and that, that seems to be all I, I need. The other thing that uh, I've been really working on recently is focus. Right. Because you know how important that is when you are taking these photographs. You yeah. have to make sure you're focused properly. Yep. And particularly at night, uh, night skies, that is a real challenge, is to make sure you're in focus. Right. Yeah. So do you have any any things that you do that that, that help you with that to, oh, yeah. to make sure you're in focus properly yeah yeah so I use uh, manual focusing yeah and uh, regardless of the composition I'll start and I'll look for a brighter star yeah you know and I'll slew the camera to it and just kind of point it at it 
and then I turn on live view, and then I'll maximize either like five times or ten times in, you know, and you kind of hunt and find that (laughs) that smudgy dot, Yeah. and then you make sure that you then dial in until you get that tack sharp focus. Because I I find that, uh, and I'm sure that most cameras and lenses are the same way, I mean, you... You you believe that when you focus to infinity, that it's in focus. No, it's but not. it's not. No, no. <laughs> it's a little shave off, right? It's, and it's just a shave. Yeah. But then when you go like, and that's the problem. I mean, with back of camera, if you just look at it as is, it'll look sharp because it's a potion stamp representation of all the all yep. the exposure, right? Yeah. So if you spent the time to actually then zoom in on back of camera yeah. you think know, you can then see it yeah but uh because there's the stars. you know i went through a, a period of time where <clears throat> i wasn't taking the time to do that and uh, coming back home it was just it was so frustrating because you're not there anymore no and your <laughs> and, shots are all and useless. the shots are useless yeah yeah because Unless they're you not focused put them on like instagram where yeah. you don't have the resolution yeah another so, thing <clears throat> sorry no go ahead another thing i do is on the wider on the wider lenses is I have a a heavy elastic band yeah that I wrap on the focus ring yeah and it's also touching the lens barrel okay so what happens is when you're shooting at night sometimes you'll recompose and move around yeah and uh, by having that heavy elastic band on the focus ring um, and also uh, reaching on to the the barrel Good it tip. creates yeah. friction, yeah. and therefore your focus ring won't move yeah. if you if you move. Yeah, because as we talked about in the car, not, this, not that we were talking about it when we were recording, but right. uh, landscapers and running. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, if you oh, set up if you set up initially in focus, yeah. uh, the chances of you being in focus at the end of that uh, two hundred meter run are low. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, that, yeah, that's true. Or even just even just moving it like six feet, yeah, can yeah. create just that that yeah. uh, that small shake. But hey, this is the first time I've noticed this on the uh, city of Edmonton Tower. Yeah, the blue. There's a big, massive video screen there. Oh, is that what that? Oh. Haven't you seen that yet? I have. I just yeah. I've never seen it from this perspective. Yeah, no, it's on. a big, massive video yeah. screen. Yeah, which no. is an odd direction, but anyway. Yeah. It's a bit of a... I often wonder who... Because uh, they're always showing the northern lights. Yeah. I, I kind of wonder, like, whose time lapse is that? <laughs> <laughs> so we're just going to hang out right now and uh, w- uh, see what happens with the sky. Yeah. We're going to wait for the, uh, the lights to come on of, in, the, in the, uh, the buildings downtown. And uh, just enjoy doing what is fantastic about photography is just standing and looking and enjoying yeah, the scenes that you're we're getting at. the um, sort of the turquoise and the greens yeah is that narrow band yeah yeah good stuff whereas if you see the see the building with the, the triangle yeah dark it is. I know. And that's the way it's, everything kind of used to be, right? Yeah. And I think that if they were to uh, spend some time and light it, it would actually look kind of cool. Yeah. Especially with that triangle bit. So, Jeff, that was that was awesome. My fingers are frozen. My Excellent. toes are not bad. Right. But it was just great standing out there watching the day turn into night. All yeah. those beautiful colors come out. Yeah. Yeah, you can in the really, downtown. You can really appreciate the colors and the gradients yeah. on nights like this. I mean clouds add drama and stuff, but there's also uh, the pure color that you can see. Yeah. The delicate like the, the greens and the different shades of blue. So one of the last things I want to talk to you about is um, a decision that you've recently made to uh, take on the uh, <laughs> the challenge of being a, a full-time photographer. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, what was the tipping point that you know made you make the the big big switch? Well, I think uh, it's never any sort of one contributor that factors into the decisions. There's often uh, there's often several. Um, there's the current career that that I had, which I had done well in. Um, but I felt that there was time for a, a change um, and uh, finally made the decision to to leap into photography. I mean, I, I was pretty good at part-time, two days a week, maybe an occasional weekend here and there. But what if I time-boxed it and gave it 18 months? How well could I do full time. Right. Could I actually have a go and uh, make a career out of this while well, I I still have the, the health and, and the, uh, the ability to go to the places I want to go. I mean, it's not necessarily always urban shooting. You want to be out in the out in the country and in the mountains and all of that kind of stuff. And do you really want to be in a in a job or a role that isn't as fulfilling as it once was. And I think also, um, you kind of look at where you are and you go, well, I'm sitting at a desk 25 years. Um, used to have one monitor, now I have two. And uh, is that what you want to you wanna do? Right. So uh, that was, that was part of the decision. So, and I'd also looked at photography as developing a, a second skill. And I think it kind of came by accident. And that is to say, you know, you have people with hobbies and interests that they do, and sometimes they're spectator orientated, right? Like they like tennis or they like watching football or soccer or hockey, but, or auto racing or something like that. But how many actually turn their their hobby into a, a skill that then if you're good enough people will pay to have your image either brought into their office or into their home right. or promote the city or a region or, or, uh, or whatever so the idea I think is to have a go making a living um, uh, shooting the, the things that I enjoy because I think that's where the passion really comes in. And I'm also quickly learning what I what I don't I don't think I'm that good at and I don't want to spend the hundreds or thousands of hours trying to get good at it. Right. Um, this is what I do and uh, I just want to become uh, one of the better ones in the country at that. <clears throat> that's my I think that uh, also uh, just sort of carrying those thoughts through uh, uh, the photography business is extremely competitive. Yeah. You have, I, I sort of compare it to uh, uh, elite athletes. Right. Where if you're a hockey player or a soccer player, a, a competitive swimmer, of all of those that train all the hours and years that are required to become that elite that elite athlete right like less than one percent you know actually get to the to the top of the mountain right right so because of that I'm wondering what you see as far as your photographs and your expertise. Right. What's going to make what you do special that will uh, grab people's attention? I think it's I think it's showing people new perspectives on common or let's say well-known uh, let's say targets or subjects, um, or showing let's say the city of Edmonton from new perspectives trying to figure out how to up the game so that what I'm doing uh, somehow finds the right people 
that also are interested in what I'm doing, almost like a win-win. Right. Um, so if I am persistent, and if my work gets consistently better and more interesting, um, I think the the uh, the hope is that as, as the name and the work, the work will sell itself. I don't know if that's naive, but I think you you first of all have to have the consistent work. Um, that body of work, and then um, by effort and hustling, as well as a dash of luck, mm-hmm. um, find or they find me, um, so that then I can continue uh, making these images either here in Edmonton or even in in uh, in other cities. Because I mean, let, let's take Night Sky for example. I mean, everybody's. I mean. Everybody shot the nebula, right? Mm-hmm. Like how do you make that special? Well, it's just more of a technical skill. But let's say if we, if we take the upcoming uh, lunar eclipse on January 31st, that is going to sort of almost set over the city of Edmonton. How can I put the two together in a, almost like a signature or iconic image? Yeah, and I guess it, it boils down to also things we talked about earlier where there's going to be a lot of research involved yep. in order to determine how that is actually going to happen. Yes. Not only yeah. with uh, with technology, uh, using uh, apps or the internet, right. uh, but also going to locations where you think that this might be yep. uh, actually happening. So. Yep. There's a lot of time that's going to be involved in that, but that's yep. part of what you're talking about yes. in making this a shot that nobody else is is um, going to get. Right. Hopefully. Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> in your case. Yeah. Hopefully. And so. Uh, and and by creating that image, then I hope that I demonstrate the the capability of planning and the execution, which you know, may inspire others or get the interest or the attention of of people that could say, oh, well, if he can do this with this, I mean, let's see what he can do with, with, with something else. And so that's Mm -hmm. the, that's the, uh, the work that I want to, uh, promote and hopefully sell and make a living. Because there's, I mean, you're right. It's almost like photography has, has become commoditized, but I think if you always try to, um, you got to be there in the field, just as we were tonight. Yep. I don't know how many people were out there doing what we were doing, but I suppose not too many. No, I don't think so. You know, and so that's half. That's half of it right there is, is is being out there, and then uh, and then making something that's that's interesting. Mm-hmm. Fingers crossed. <laughs> so the thing that uh, I, I'm really curious about now that you've made this uh, decision to become a full-time photographer, right? Do you have any worries about losing the fun that you have, or the joy that we talked about, right? Right. Taking your photographs. I think I think there's a there's a bit of that, and I have noticed. I'm far more cautious now about what I post. Um, a bit slower, which isn't a bad thing, if you know what I mean, because it gives you a chance to look at the image before you finally publish it. But there's there's less of a sort of carefree um, okay, yeah, style before I just publish it. No, okay, that's fine, and then and then, uh, but now because it's work and it's it's all your reputation now. It was before, but it's different when it's like, oh, yeah, this is it. I find myself more, more cautious, and I find myself questioning the image more. Mm-hmm. And and I think that sort of removes a bit of the fun. It, it's, it's sort of, I think, the transition from being a, a, a regular amateur to now, okay, this is this is the portfolio. This is the work. Um, you kind of live and die on it, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and and you're also uh, 
the work that you're putting out there is yeah. also establishing who you are as a photographer. Yes. Your okay. Yeah. You look at this photograph and you yeah. say, "Oh, that's Jeff's picture." Right. Right. So you're you're trying to sort of establish the line, yeah, the stream that you're starting to follow. Yeah. Yeah. You're very uh, very sensitive now to mistakes as well, like mistakes that I make in the in the uh, in the business, and then you try to to remedy or fix them, and you just <laughs> you know it's 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 a very different. Wouldn't say it's attitude. I don't know. Tempo is a bit different because now you can shoot seven days a week. Yeah. I mean, weeks kind of. There's this. Weeks become a bit of a blur. There isn't that sort of Monday to Friday. Okay, right. now I've got a weekend and then restart. Yeah. Now it's on almost yeah. all the time, and you find yourself sometimes getting a bit weary. If you know what I mean. Yeah. And then you become a bit uh, upset with yourself if you don't um, perform as quickly as, let's say, you you, uh, you had hoped or envisioned or, 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 or mm -hmm. planned. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's just a, you, you kind of, you eat what you kill kind of thing. Yeah. You got that going on and yeah. learning how to, learning how to price your, your images, right? Yeah. I mean, when it's your, really your only source of income, it's a bit, it's a bit different. And, um, and, you know, I mean, you're at the, at the beginning of, of this journey. Right. Uh, and it, it takes time to, to let things sort of settle to get to where you're comfortable. Yep. And you get your routine and your rhythm going. Yep. Yep. Um, but coming, circling back to the question about the fun. No, I haven't, I haven't lost the fun yet. I think there's a lot more out there. A lot more out there to do yeah uh, but yeah it's a bit more real because you still have to pay the bills that's right <laughs> it's pretty it's pretty real good question and uh, I suppose to you uh, like you have uh, yourself on uh, some social media sites right now yeah um, are you thinking that you're gonna make yourself a web page also Yep, so I've got a, a website that I'm I'm uh, I'm building. It's not ready to launch yet, but I'm on the I'm on the social media, and I mean that is that's quite the uh, it's a bit of a two-edged sword. It is, isn't it? I mean, it's are you going to chase the algos like the algorithms all the time, or are you just going to continuously just put out you know decent and and, and interesting work? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a bit of a beast that you're continuously feeding, right? <laughs> That's right. Like, my yeah. word. But, I mean, what's interesting is is um, Zuckerberg's recent change where uh, <clears throat> I think we're on, like, Facebook 2,492 right now <laughs> with all these <laughs> weekly updates and features. And, yeah. You know, Facebook, I think, kind of lost lost the plot as they continue to to monetize and all that kind of stuff which is their right I mean that's fine they can they can kill the they, like they, they can make the beast and they can kill the beast or society will just tire of it mm -hmm. um, but there was this one feature that I liked on Facebook and that used to be used to be able to filter posts right by photos yeah and just show me the photographs yeah and then I think a few years ago Facebook killed that and yeah. I'm like what are you doing and they, it used to be, uh, uh, it used to be timeline driven, and then it's like, oh no, we're going to decide what we show you and all this kind of crap, and it just, it just lost its, yeah. lost its way. But yeah, social media is just a bit of a, it's a bit of a. Uh, well, it certainly helps you though, it, to a certain degree, to you know, make sure people know who you are, and see what you're doing. Yeah. And then with yeah. the web page, you have all sorts of opportunities to, you know, communicate information and, and show your work the way you want it to be seen. Right. Yeah. So I, you know, once you once you know what's going on about that, let me know because uh, we'll make sure that help you out and uh, oh. letting everybody else know what's going on. Yeah, it's very kind of you. So we're just about home, and uh, I really 
I've really had a good time talking with you today. Oh, that's great. Me so, too. So thanks very much for, uh, you know, taking time out of your day and uh, going out into the cold and taking photographs. It's been awesome. Yeah, it really has. Thank you. So, Thank you very much. Thanks, Jeff. You have been listening to Terry Lawson Photography Conversations. Conversations with those involved in the arts. 